most likely available online. Yes, they are in fact already online. Um, if you go to the Meetup page, there's a link there where you can get them for the, their usual projects. Uh, yeah, this is the inaugural lecture of the Categorical Data Meetup, and the Categorical, categorical Data Community has until now been a completely online thing. It started in like 2010 or so. David back here started it, and this is the first like in-person meeting that we've ever so thank you all for coming and what I'm going to do is give the introductory talk about this material uh, some of you may have seen it before but we can uh, take questions and kind of move through the slides in the directions people are interested in but the goal here is that this categorical data software and mathematics that we've been creating is at a point in its life where much of the research is done and now as a new technology, it needs a community to grow. And so uh, we would encourage anyone here who's interested in what they see to try to engage with us and with other people um, to try and, and try the technology out um, or just uh, generate interest and you know, the usual stuff. So, ask questions. Ask questions. Category theory database and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, what is the background here? So, Category theory was designed post-World War II to migrate theorems from one branch of math to another. And David here and some people before him figured out that you could actually use it to migrate information uh, from one computer system to another. And so we've been building and doing a lot of math and building a, a tool that we call AQL um, for algebraic query language. It's an open source tool. It's available at that. Uh, URL and so are the slides, and it's essentially ready to go. It, um, we use it now on non-trivial problems that handle thousands or sometimes even millions of rows of data, and um, we have a, a little startup that spun out of MIT that's trying to commercialize it. Uh, maybe for now we can think of it as a lifestyle business, but anyway, um, it's, it's growing up and. This meeting is part of the growing up process. Yeah, so, that I will just get into the material unless there are questions or comments. All right. So, I am going to skip actually saying what category theory is because there is a way to understand all of this without having to use any category theory. So, if there's interest, we could return to this or have other lectures or what have you, but uh, I'm going to try to skip the actual category group tonight. So this is essentially the gist of what categorical databases are. Up here on the screen is a database schema. This is how we, in our categorical approach to databases, schemas. We think of them as directed play graphs with labeled nodes and edges. Uh, equations between paths and the graph. So up here at the top is a database schema that is meant to represent employees and departments. That's M in depth, they're abbreviated there. And then some relationships between employees and departments. For example, manager, that's the self loop on the employee node. Every employee works in a department and every department has a secretary. Employees have first and last names, and departments have names. And in conjunction with that graph are data integrity constraints in the form of equations through the graph. So there's two separate constraints. The first one on the left there, on the left there, says that every manager Every employee works in the same department that their manager works in. Yes, what David said. Every employee works in the same department that their manager works in. Uh, just a business tool that you might put in a database. And the one on the right says that every secretary works in the department that they are the secretary for. Another uh, business rule there. And Beneath the schema is a database instance on that schema. One table per node, so one table per employees, one table per departments, 
a table for strings. Each table has an ID column that represents uh, the actual employees in the actual departments. And then for each edge in the graph, there is a column in the table. So for example, employee 101's manager is employee 103. And department Q10's uh, name is computer science. Tables have to be such that they satisfy the equations that are in the schema, which hopefully these all do. So, uh, any questions on how we think of schemas and database instances on those schemas? All right, that's a good sign. So, you can um, build categories out of schemas and functors out of instances and all kinds of stuff like that. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to instead talk about uh, these things called schema mapping. So it's not so interesting just to have schemas and instances. You also want to have relationships between schemas so that you can move data from one schema to another. Yes. I guess I'm thinking since some people are here because they do care about the category theory. Maybe you could just quickly mention that each one of those schemas is a category. Um, the objects, if you go back one, they're there. Yeah, the, uh, the nodes are the objects, and the morphisms are all the paths you can write. And the commutative diagrams are written down there. So there is, there is, in case you're wondering and you want to watch this whole cat talk, and that's when you do it, is that's kind of how you are there would, would, uh, people here like to hear the category theory? Can you, can you maybe uh, give us like a two sentence example of how the different category database is different from a, a regular table relational database? So sure. So one difference is that uh, these are all functions. So the manager a function taking IDs to IDs. In typical relational databases, you have relations, and here we have real functions. Uh, another instance is, or another difference is how we think of strings. So for us, they're just equations, and different relational systems have their own kinds of data integrity constraints. So the fact that we have functions and equations is something that comes from the category. Can you clarify something? Um, you said that managers are functions from employees to employees, but managers themselves are also fields in a schema. So I'm wondering. Is there a difference between like the field level manager and the manager as like as like a column? Is that right? Like, so, manager as a function. So here, what at the schema level, you just have a, um, a like a, a symbol, the symbol manager. Its type is employee to employee. Mm -hmm. For each one of those, you get a column down here, and then in your instance, it's the instance that has the function, right? So the function is 101 goes to 103, 102 goes to 102, 103 goes to 103. So is there any kind of key structure to it? Which well, the, uh, the IDs the, the are the primary keys. Okay. And yeah. there's foreign keys for every um, arrow. Every arrow indicates a foreign key column. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so right. even the data itself, the strings, al, bob, et cetera, if you, if you pretend that some last names would be a foreign key to that one column table. Yeah. We don't actually implement it that way, but that's a theoretical way of looking at every single error, every single column is a function of an important key. Can, can this concept be implemented on a standard RDB method? Uh, this way of storing it, yeah. And in fact, the tool will do that sometimes when it is appropriate to do so. Some of the operations that we're going to see later cannot be implemented in relational algebra, for example, but at least the storing of the data like this can module a few minor details about things like nulls and stuff like that. Other questions? All right. So let's see. We have our schemas and we have our instances. And what to do schema in instance is query it or merge it with other data or perform some operations on it, right? So schemas and inst instances aren't that interesting unless you have operations on them that you can use to do interesting things. And so in the categorical approach to databases, uh, the fundamental building block that relates schemas 
to each other is called a schema mapping. And those are uh, directional. So a schema mapping taking schema S to schema T, it's a function that takes the nodes in the source schema S to the nodes in the target schema T. And it takes the edges in the source schema S to pass through the target schema T in a way that preserves the equations of uh, the source schema. So an example on this schema that we have is the, the schema map and it takes employees to employees and departments to departments and strings to strings. So just the identity on the nodes. And then the identity on the edges, except it takes manager to the composition of manager with manager. So this self-mapping takes conceptually every manager to their second level manager. That's an example self-schema mapping on this schema here. And it has to, we have to check for it to be a schema mapping that it preserves the equations in the schema. So that means that we have to check that this here uh, implies this equation down here, which it in fact does. And when you use our tool and you enter the schema mapping into it, it actually checks using an automated uh, that this entailment holds. So schema mappings are very strong semantics preserving relationships between uh, schemas. And I'll give some more examples in a minute. Let me pause here. Questions. Is that your own notation? Was, uh, Which one? Are you the arrow you mean? Oh, the, the circle. Oh, so this is a sort of a traditional symbol for composition. Uh, sometimes people use a dot or a semicolon, um, but we just we're just using here to indicate composition of edges in the graph. Does that answer your question? No. Uh, so manager composed of manager means the path start here, go around once, go around twice, so the path of length two. So that's recursion. That's what that symbol means. Uh, it just means follow. So the edge manager followed by the edge manager. So we're trying to indicate pass through here. And a path is a sequence of edges. And then this is a path of length two. The first edge is manager, the second edge is manager. You could have another one the manager works. Yes, that's the right. Here's, a, here's another path. The path of manager follow, or works up. This is not the entity relationship one. Oh no, this is not the entity relationship. Okay. So this is your own definition. Yes, this is the this is how you define it. Exactly. It's your map, your symbology. Uh, this is. So it's got an error that works in manager switch in one by one. Here? Yeah, so manager works is the department of employee. So they do have to be arranged like tip to tail, right? So they do have to be like cap. So wouldn't it shouldn't it be manager works to follow? Mm -hmm. It's this uh, function composition of takes like f of g. So it's like oh, work. So it's got to be back. So what? Yeah. Got it. So part of work will be the high wire model. You got a network one. One to many, many. So you should probably sort of put that on hold because what you're seeing here, all of those kinds of relationships are encoded in specific ways in our own data model. Right. Because you have to be able to ferret out that from those one should be in here. There are ways to do things like that, and we'll go into it. But for now, we just have graphs and pass through the graph. Okay. It's very foundational what we're doing from the ground up. Just a notational note: I recommend you add prepositions and camel case to these spectrum. Prepositions. Manager of works. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the read like English. Yeah. I think even in the built-in example, it probably does that. That's a good. Okay, uh, other question about here. This is kind of the crux of it's like it's important to understand the definitions here. Uh, where do you want? So, uh, well, if this is the crux, I might as well. I, mean, I, I know enough to know that those are dots, those are functors, and the mapping, I understand the composition. When you, so those are, when you say truth preserving equation, the S is a set of objects of the F depths. 
string, yes, and we're moving to it to another T of different objects. Right. So a the mapping goes between two schemas, the source and the target. And the source example and here is actually the source and the target are both this schema. So it's a self mapping that I'm giving the example of. Maybe not the best example, because, but we don't have one schema to work with here. So it's a mapping from this schema to itself. And we want to make sure that the equations in our schema, when we do the mapping, uh, are preserved. So maybe I missed your, your formal definition of a schema. It was the objects and the, the functors plus the equations? Yep, it's the, the graph there along with the equations. It's the formal definition. That is the definition of the schema. Right? That's also, that induces a category and you get, they go together as a combination. So you're truth preserving uh, function are two functions. Yep, function from nodes to nodes, function from edges to paths. That has to be such that when you translate these equations, they're uh, they still follow from the equations in the target. So, uh, maybe the data. Yeah, I wanted to say um, that those rules make it turn into a functor from one category to another. So that's what's happening in the math side. But the reason we have all these rules about like you know, checking all these things and stuff is that we know that once you have a schema mapping uh, and you run the kind of ETL on it or you move the data, you migrate the data from it, you're never going to end up with something that doesn't work. You'll always come up with an instance that satisfies all the constraints before you even hit go. So it doesn't even have, even have to look at the instance. It checks that these things are going to hold before it compiles, as it's compiling, and then you know it's going to automatically satisfy all the constraints, form key constraints, primary key constraints, et cetera, on the other side. And that's why we're making these rules, is because they're exactly the ones you need to ensure up front that that's going to always work. Is the goal to be able to define schema mappings or to be able to automatically define schema mappings? Uh, right. So the goal is to define them. There are techniques to create them automatically, but that's sort of out of scope for what we're talking about tonight. So we assume people are going to create these um, somehow. So a schema mapping, I'm going to follow along with what you were just saying. You use the word ETL. So classic ETL is you yeah, have a, a relations, you run queries. Uh, Relational algebra predicate calculus, whatever you want to get a new set of schemas here. It's roughly the so schema mappings are but it would be analogous to queries in, in relational algebra. Kind of. What happens is that it's a lot of logical models. Yes, that's true. And a fun, and so you want the mappings helps you turn one logical model into another logical model. You're saying is if if this if with this diagrammatic fashion that you're creating here. If you can fit one into this, then the math can fall off that you be able to get the scheme back. But it's the definition of all these what these what's the point, what are the lines, is that a one to many relationship? These are all many to one. What many what? Many to one. Many employees can work in the same departments. Many what? departments can and departments can have many employees, so it's both directions. Many employees, one department. So the error always goes many to one. They're, they're functions. They're functions. Many employees in the department, but then the department also. Many to many would imply that each department might have multiple, the employee might have multiple departments. Right. Right. Well, it's in this well, model here, it's a, it's a five statements. Yeah. We could do, this also does many to many, um, but that you would do it almost the same way. I don't know if you have an example of that. Oh, class so, what, so right now, just look at a hierarchy. Okay. Yeah, they're functions. And functions mean uh, like a function in a sense of math, where each, for each thing on the input, there's exactly, or, yeah, it goes to one thing on the, the target. So one to many. One to one. one, to one. I think this one is not many to many. Based my understanding, this one should be employment at go to one department. So they have many employees go to one department. They didn't say many to have a go to employee. So they only say if there's some secretary in that one, they can be the employment. So that's where the ID comes from. Right, so here's the function, right? 101 does 103, 102 does 102. <laughs> like this, which you, which you can't have is like another 103 here that goes somewhere else. Um, that's uh, why don't we move on because maybe some of this will become clearer 
Uh, Brian, can you call up those slide numbers that you used? Oh, so this is slide six, and now we're on slide seven. Okay, so uh, what happens if you have a mapping between schemas? Why would you want to create one? If you have a mapping F taking schema S to schema T, then what that gives you is three ways to move data between schemas S and T. So someone asked earlier, um, are schema mappings like queries? The answer is not quite. What really happens is that each schema mapping is associated with three queries. And we call them delta and pi and sigma. And we use these to actually move data around between. So what does that look like? Well, so you have your schema mapping F going from S to T. The delta operation, it's a projecty-like operation. I'll give an example in a minute. It takes database instances on the schema T and moves them to the schema S. It, it moves in the opposite direction of the schema S. Target to go back to source. From target to source. Yep. The other two, pi and sigma, where they they're guaranteed to exist by the math, and they move from the source to the target. It goes out of target because you told. The mathematicians seem to favor these because this one, for example, is product-like, kind of join-like, and the sigma is uh, sum-like. So they well, seem to prefer to study Greek, but okay. <laughs> I mean, we could have, yeah, we could have named them whatever. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, there. These are you might think of them as quasi inverses to this delta operation here. They're not true inverses, but they're they're sort of like the most inverse that they could be, given how we've defined everything so far. And I guess the point to notice on this slide is that the definition of the delta f operation is actually very simple. In the category theory, here's your functor f that goes from f s to t. An instance on T, it's a functor from T to a category of sets, which we didn't really talk about, but we could. You just compose them, and now you have a functor from S to the category of sets. That's an instance on the schema S, and that is just the definition of, of delta. So basically, we've defined a very simple thing, delta, and then category theory gives us this pi and this sigma. And we say, we, we claim that these operations are the basis for a data migration and data integration tool that can do many of the things SQL can, that can do many of the things that Prometheus can. And the tool that we build implements these three operations and a few others. So, questions here? <laughs> uh, it's good. What's coming up next is examples of these. <laughs> All right. Questions? I, yeah, I might suggest, I don't know if you have in mind, but we didn't really talk about this, but I might suggest we do a kind of short presentation and go around and see where, what people are actually here for and why they came and see if we can speak to those interesting or if that sounds like a good idea. But if people have kind of, or we do that after the presentation, but to try to understand why people are here and if we, we can provide that. Right. So basically what's up next are examples of these, then I'll show the tool. And then we can do what everybody wants to do. Okay. Well, okay. Although, I, I mean, I do like to get through this just because without it, it's. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so, all right. Examples of these three operations that are the cent center of this thing. Okay, so here's a schema, a source schema, here's a target schema, and there's a functor f. It takes string to string, int to int, it takes n1 to n, n2 to n. It takes name to name, salary to salary, age to age. So basically, exactly what you would. Also, these are two data models. You can have one, one, and two. The other one has one, just n. And your job is to move the data back and forth between them in as easy a way as you can. So you write down where the nodes go, and then you hit the button. And then uh, it does something. That's the goal. Is that what your software does? Yes. Right. So what the software does is you give it F. It checks that you've written down something that's equation preserved. So the existence it. is the model on the left. I'm sorry? The existence, the current model is on the left. Into the model on the right. 
Well, the mapping goes from left to right. The delta operation actually takes instances here, one table, to instances here, two tables. So the actual data migration is in a reverse direction. This one, there's two other. This, yeah, this one, it goes, the mapping goes left to right, and the data migration goes right to left. And the other two, in the pi and the sigma, the data migration also goes left to right. So one mapping gives you three ways to migrate your data. One of which was that. So it's the cycle. Is that automated or is that something we construct? So you give it this. Oh, and we give it to one of the lab. We get you give it this whole thing up here. Oh, you give it this, you give it this, you give it to that. So that's the starting point. You give the tool a, a schema mapping. Then what so you we get, oh we do it by so that's how it's defined by us. Yes, you do. We don't we, we interpret the left. And we the right. Final rules. These are the left and the right are and F, they're given. They have to obey the rules. They have to be equation and preserving, but they're input to to the tool. And I'll show the demo. You like type in the thing on the left, you type right. in the thing on the right, and the app. Yeah. What the tool gives you is a way, so you give it this up here. Then what it gives you is a query essentially. It would take, for example, this table and emit this table. I can see what yeah. that would be helpful to the object. Oh, yeah. I mean, in the dark, uh, no schema object, uh, they call it no SQL. Everything's a document. This gets you structure back. Yeah. Structure is good. I see even more. I see more than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions on this one? You were saying something, David. I have some questions. So well, I was run the SQL, so it's a little bit confusing because the first ID is one, the Alex was salary is one thousand, but then you get the ID for is twenty. So I can say this Alex maybe age is thirty is not the ID for. So it's it's not mapping by ID. So you have to, you don't have the called primary index ID. So what's the index ID you non match wrong. You know what I'm talking about? I think what you're getting at is there's no connection between these two tables. And therefore the one and the four so, are not yeah, connected. I know. You don't have a connection from N1 to N2, but you want to collect it to the N table is your final table, is that right? So your ID will be A. The name is Alex, the salary was one hundred dollars and the age will be twenty. But if that person should be thirty, how do you know this twenty is correct? That's my question. Well, because you don't have the primary index ID. So the twenty maybe is wrong number. Well, remember, you're, going wrong. Wrong. you're going right to left. You start oh, here, here, here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's not from here to here. Oh, oh okay. that's the uh, direction. But why you want, why you don't use in one two three instead of using four two five six? Uh, That's we, like more than we, we did that on purpose because in this yeah. data model, the actual values of the IDs are irrelevant. In fact, everything that we do here is invariant under change of IDs. But we'll fix your problem soon. In a later slide, we'll show how you take care to keep the same IDs. Yes, that yeah, will we'll be do that you. You do that in other slides, right? Uh, attributes and stuff. They're just to uh, connect well. I thought oh, we have a form of so Yeah, yeah, this there. One. Yeah, there it saves it. So maybe we can skip ahead. So suppose you had a different oh, source yeah, schema. Oh, yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be for, awesome. Yeah. So when you define the, the mapping, which you're driving these three different transforms from, mm -hmm. you need that, or else you don't have Information. You, you've lost information. You didn't want to lost that. Oh yes, there's no guarantee that these operations aren't lossy. In fact, many times they are lossy. Yeah. yeah. But they're exactly as lossy as the map. That's what they mean. Lossy. 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 But you still you're still doing something quote practical by doing ETL and losing things or joining things. Yeah. I know I, I brought the scare quotes practical because 
the Alaska. Yeah. Okay. I, for what it's worth, I, I think if you lead with the, the ETL story, it's a it's a great story because you're you're essentially saying here is a Informatica Avenue Shield competitor that has some sort of formalism. Yes. We have an ab initio informatica competitor with the formalism. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I guess uh, that was one operation, the delta. We give it a, a schema mapping, and it moves data in the opposite direction of the schema mapping. There's two others, one called pi and one called sigma. So we have the same schema mapping up here at the top. It takes n1 and n2 to n, and everything else gets mapped straight across. And uh, what this one does is it takes instances on the left and it moves them to the instances on the right. And in this case, what pi f does is a Cartesian product. So you have two tables here, each with three rows. The result of doing pi is a table with nine rows. Did you change the definition? Because uh, delta used to be projected. Now you call it pi. Pi's product. Pi's product. Okay. okay. It just be a join. That's a join. Yep. In this case, yeah, it's a. There's nothing to join here, so it's sort of a degenerate join. Okay. I'm looking at a 2014 publication. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean here we call it product because it's degenerate. In general, if you if you have other things going on, I can turn into a join. In this particular slide, there's there's no joining going on. It's a degenerate join. It's uh, three times three equals nine. Question about this slide. Okay. And then the final operation is sigma. So given the same schema mapping as before, it also takes instances on the left and turns them into instances on the right. It does uh, a union operation, but in this case, um, the columns don't line up. And so it ends up creating uh, new values in your table, null values you think of like this. And but they're labeled null. Yeah. They're labeled which null, means, which means later you can set null sub 4 equal to 5, null sub 4 equal to Carl, null sub 4 equal to null sub 6 without knowing what they are. So they're just variables waiting for data. So in a SQL database, there's just one thing called null, and it's maybe you have a million of them in your database. Here, each null is meant to be its own independent little thing, and that's what we mean by null. Is not nothing. It's not well, there. It's not null. Yeah, there, the, but the point is, this null might be different from this null, and so we need to distinguish them. So we call this one null one, and this one null two. Null meaning no data, or real data. Yeah. No, I mean, it is what the math says it is. Well, but null is a word that's supposed to mean a variable waiting for a data. Right? That's the kind of Or your data, the null data is a field, original. That's the way you decide. You said null is waiting for the data, but when you merge the data, like us, we use the data every day. So when we say null, means this data is missing. We don't mm -hmm. know what's the age for Alex. Yeah. So that was so it's right. not waiting for the while you got in. So you cannot imputate it or you can say, okay, I can find that person no more data. This data is means missing. You don't know what's the age for means. It also here means missing or unknown. Yeah, it yeah. means unknown. It's, it's just unknown. that in our system we can later set that unknown equal to something. Yes. We want we'll, to. We'll, we'll say an A, we'll always say num, we'll say num. Yeah. I guess the Somebody asked, how is this different from SQL? And one way is that in SQL there's like one null value, and here there are there are many. Is so is an intuition about the subscripting there? Tell me if I'm way off field. I've been getting into Canran and rel bars, and you go underscore zero underscore one. They have the ability to be unified at a certain point, and but we need to label them differently, and they might turn out to be equal. Exactly. Okay. This comes up in relational database theory too, the label of nulls. It just doesn't come up in SQL for some reason. You know, but SQL and relational database guys are but obviously I got um, Anyway, I was going to show a demo of the tool now, but I'll just mention like why why would you ever want to use these operations instead of some other ones? 
And the answer is they have these very interesting and useful mathematical properties. So for example, suppose we start with this database instance here. We apply sigma to get this one here, and then we apply delta to come back to the schema over here. Category theory says that there is a unique a unique map from this uh, database instance here to this one down here. Uh, it's called the unit. And so very interesting properties fall out of these definitions. Um, and we can use these properties in the tool. We can use the properties when we do the integration. And, and that's why we like it. So uh, with that in mind. So does your software convert relational to categorical? Or can, yes. And, and what can you learn about the new the changes in the data? So the tool, you can point it at a SQL database, and it will suck in the schema, and it will suck in the data, and it will convert it like this. Um, what does that tell you? Um, I mean, the way to view the data differently, that it's going to give you some kind of inspiration? or I think what, what one of our consultants says is that once you have it in this form, it's very easy to prototype with it. So you can say, oh, well, I have two columns here. What would happen if I merge these into one? And you type very easily. You say, like, import this schema, but set n1 equal to n2. Go. Hit sigma or some, one of these sigma or pi or whatever. So this would and it'll say, oh, that's what I would get. OK, let me try again. You know, it's very fast. So this would be helpful for logical or physical data modelers? I think yes. logical. 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 Okay. Uh, just an alternative basis with which to do modeling, you know, different from ER modeling, different from OWL modeling. Yeah. Okay. Other, other questions? Sorry, you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, is there a, guess what I'll add up to what you're saying, is there another way to present it, to view it, other than just that? Uh, in other words, is this translated to some three-dimensional holographic uh, conceptual data model? That's a good question. I know it translates into like multi-story equational logic and that kind of stuff. Right, but the map on the way to then um, maybe you know, create some visual. Or maybe you can tell us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What would you want to see as a visual? Well, everybody's trying to get the, what's, what's it look like, right? Oh, I see. I see. Yep. Yep. Because you've got all the analytics and, and uh, no, just to just to view the data. Uh, because even people that do a SQL on it, they want to know what's the data look like in order to get the right SQL. But I have all the data fields and like, like what's the what's the it's, it's, it's a modeling tool. It's a tool to see what what is uh you just uh on these data lakes projects you ingest all this data. Okay, well come from a disparate number of sources. Is there a model that we can see? Because that's, I think that's how to uncover. Yeah. When you see it, the tool is exactly that to do to do modeling. Yeah. And you can look at all the different schemas you have and see how they all relate and stuff like that. But is it what uh, is it just that one schema presentation? That's just one after another, just like that. Well, I guess I should show the tool like, uh, as it exists okay. now, which is much less than what it could be. So if people want to get involved, we can. Have, it's an open source. Uh, Cool. So, right. Yeah, open source tool. I can call it a GitHub. I'll show the demo now, but I forgot this slide, which I think is kind of important because a lot of people ask, what if there's a connection between these two schemas? What do the delta sigma and the pi do? And the answer is uh, the delta operation does a join decomposition, and the sigma and the pi, they, they both do a join in this case. So, kind of a very natural. Um, Semantics, I guess, in this case. But, okay, I will show the tool now unless there are other questions. So, what are some of the uh, the applications for this in the real world, and, and how is this going to change the world and make everything cooler well, and better? Back in the. We have somebody who has. Um, Everyone in the lab is using using some kind of density functional theory is called, but some kind of way of modeling chemicals, and they do they run simulations on these things. But each person saves it in a different format because they adjust different parameters, and so each one has their own database in some sense. 
And so what this tool could be used to do is to take all those different databases and find some commonality where we have the scientists doing things separately and we're going to help them kind of be able to query each other's work and that, that sort of thing. So it's really about integrating data from different sources. Can people still see the screen if I drop the lens? Not that. too much. No, that's too great. Down one or that's great. That's great. That's great. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's like low. It's like. We should have more fun more jobs. We need to get more done. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Right. It's like slow to. So, this is the tool. It's You can get it on GitHub. It's a Java project. Uh, it has a lot of stuff we didn't talk about today. For example, um, it lets you give definitions for what strings and integers and all these things actually are. In the slides, you just sort of assume. <laughs> the existence of strings and integers and whatnot. Um, but basically, you type in as text your schemas and your mappings. Field names. Field names, right. So, um, here's this employee schema. It's the schema from the slides. It's entity, our employee, and department. Uh, the foreign keys, there's three. Manager works in secretary. Each has a source and a target. Um, there are the equations we talked about. Um, there are uh, also the, we like to distinguish um, edges in the graph that end on types. We call them attributes rather than foreign keys. So we have first name, last name, and the name of a department. So this is literally just a textual rendering of the, the graphical location from the slides. And here is an instance. It's written down as a set of uh, equations, but the tool can also load data from uh, SQL if you wanted to. So what this says is we have three employees, 101, 102, 103, two departments. Here's a bunch of equations that say, for example, the first name of employee 101 is Al. And you can push the button, and you can look at the schema as a oops, from what? You can look at the schema as a graph. I guess there's no integer value uh, stuff here. And then you can look at the instance um, as a table. It's exactly like you might expect. You see some provenance there in the employee. When you just opened that ID column up, you saw that you knew where um, that guy came from, I guess. Yeah. So one of the things the tool does is because in this data model, the IDs are essentially meaningless, is that the tool will just choose them. So for example, um, this there's still three employees. There's still two departments. But the IDs that the tool is, should, is displaying to you says there's an, ID, there's an employee 102, but the other de employees are actually department P10 secretary and the secretary manager. So the math is essentially uh, given a, like a more, dis, more descriptive uh, visualization here, kind of telling you how things are, are related to each other. Um, I probably did it for <laughs> so John okay. is calculating the names based on relation. relation. Yes, it is. And it's doing so in a very particular When you migrate way. data also, yeah. it also it looks kind of random. But you said right, so here, for example, suppose I just deleted some of these things. And actually, I'm going to, um, just so we don't end up with an infinite database, I'm going to put a data integrity constraint that says we only have so many people. I'm just going to delete some of these equations. And you push the button, and if the tool figured out, now you have six employees and two departments and 10 null strings. And, and the reason is because it added all these managers and it added all these secretaries, right. all the people that it knew it had to have. So it's kind of like a logical database in some ways. A deductive database. Yeah. Do you have equivalent mappings? Uh, how do you choose which one becomes the ID, or is it impossible to have equivalent mappings? Well, the IDs, you can't do anything in the tool that depends on the actual values of the IDs. It's impossible. So it shouldn't matter how the tool chooses, because the users can't actually get at the IDs. Oh, no, I meant, how does the, so if you had two relations that were both 
essentially very complex arrows to, or maybe not complex arrows, and that they were. It's non-deterministic. The tool. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Okay, cool. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. okay, okay, whatever. Because there are each employee has to have a manager, and so the extra employees are the managers. For example. Well, you can't have no. Because you. What about the CEO? So what I what I did sort of behind the scenes here is I added an equation in the schema uh, that says manager composed of manager equals manager. That means what does that uh, mean? What does that mean? That means that someone sufficiently high in the company is their own boss. And actually, that would be like the seventh level manager equals the eighth level manager, or something like that. Yeah. It's a very flat. Is that, is that how you write it in your language? That's your language language place? Yeah, this is a programming language with a, a syntax and an antler grammar and all that. And yeah, this is exactly. But I mean, that's your, your own in, uh, in context, in incarnation. <laughs> Yep, we designed the language ourselves. So is this is is this AQL? This is AQL. Okay. Yep. AQL. So um, let's see what else I can show you guys. We're kind of running out of time. So is there anything you guys wanted to see? The only other thing left is I can show you the schema mappings and the delta sigma and pi is in the tool. But um, I'd like to know what you guys came here for. Want to know about? I'm kind of interested in what the internal representation of the of like discovering a I guess differential <laughs> uh, one of these uh, product or, or some I forgot what the first one was difference was, uh, was oh, the delta the project project, project? Yeah. Um, that was like uh, so like what is how what is the calculation for project is that well. Is it because I assume that these are just like DAGs in memory, and then somehow the delta is computed? What what does that look like? What does that computation look like? So this thing will it can do the delta straight up like directly. It can also emit SQL to do it. Um, so in an actual older version of this tool, um, that's how it worked. So this is something very similar to the to this, the delta example from the slides. You push the run button, and then down here at the bottom, you see uh, a whole bunch of SQL code that it emits, and then that implements the delta. Okay, I see. But not not all of them can be implemented that way. So the, there's actually more expressive power in AQL than there is in relational algebra, anyway. I see. Uh, other things you guys are interested in, and it's 8 o'clock, so. Uh, 803. 803. I'm curious how uh, this relates to the semantic web stuff with ontologies mapping into other ontologies. You're having an ontology match another ontology to another one. And how that. You can use this to do many of the same kinds of things. If you compare the expressive power of this with the expressive power of RDF, say, uh, you find that they're actually pretty different. Um, there are some things that we can do that. Uh, RDF can't. There are things that OWL can do that we can't. They're they're incomparable. But uh, we tend to favor ours as based on equational logic and category theory as opposed to description logic. Um, but you can use the tool to do many of the same things. And what what is the difference? So we help you to understand more about this. Realm. Okay. So one difference. Um, so the the tool can actually emit. Uh, like OWL schemas and such, and you can't, for example, say that you can encode a graph in OWL, but you can't give equations between paths in it. So that's one difference. We have equations and the graphs, and, and like your mother's sister is your is your aunt, something like that. Well, so that you can say here that you can't say in RDF. Yes. You can do the this you can do navigation. What you do is the neural navigation. I'm sorry? Navigation is not a guess once you've done this. I'm not quite sure what you mean by navigation. Like if you, if you, how to find the record. You've done it in math. You know how to get to call it a predicate oh, of mother yes. and the name. 
But you can't do a descriptor that this falls out of your design. Well, I mean, the print description, the owl, because it's based on description logic, has nice properties. We just say we have nicer properties, so we're based on equation logic instead of description logic. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. It's, just, uh, it's not worth your time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, other questions? How have you been finding people willing to uh, invest in this technology? You have a company, you have people who are doing it potentially for utility, so you have consultants. What is, what is the play? Who are you resonating with? Right. Yeah. Why? I'm curious. Right now, it's uh, grant funded technology transfer grants to get out of academia into uh, the market. And one of the things we're doing now is trying to, to shop it around at people to try it on something real. Um, that's sort of the next step. So, And that's one of the reasons for this meetup. If anyone wants to try this thing um, on a real world problem working with us, uh, we'd be more than happy to try it. And um, I think there's a lot of value add we could bring. And uh, do please let us know. Um, but a lot of people have also been finding us. Um, they have data integration needs that don't seem to be satisfied by existing tools. They look around, they see that this is different, and, and they come to us and they try it out. Or they're functional programmers who like how functional programming feels, they like the guarantees, and they think maybe if category theory is the thing that's doing that for me, then categorical databases would also be useful. Or maybe there are people who took a bunch of math in college and, and and like category theory and thought, yeah, that could be useful. How do these guys do it? Um, they seem to come from all over the place. We don't know where you guys all came from. We said this is a category theory database, and well, people well, come. Well, so we... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find that the juxtaposition of those two words is going to get you some interesting people. The category theory will get you the functional math Haskell people. The database might get you people who've been doing SQL their entire career, and maybe, and I'm one of those, uh, need some basic schooling on the on, on the mathematics. So I'm just talking out loud about what challenges you guys have. I'm not here to tell you I, I have any solutions, but it's an interesting juxtaposition of because databases is such a stodgy term uh, that that has. And people erroneously think SQL equals relational and relational theory, and so you have you have it's an interesting market you're going into. Is yeah. what I'm saying. That's Maybe what, what we should do now is stop the lecture, but then hang out here so anyone who wants to stay, we can chat more, um, and get everyone home on time, um, take a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody already beat us to it. Oh. Yeah, I, I emailed uh, free food at MIT. And, 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 and a bunch of gypsies showed up on the and grabbed all the food. I know. Some were 14 or something like this. Yeah, I also emailed vultures at MIT. Well, I saw vultures at MIT. That's a great resource. All right, well, that's it. Is there any interest in doing more of these? I mean, there's so much material here. I, I would be interested if we could figure out a way to lay out some foundational. Please be aware of, you know, like if you're taking a 500 level class, you need to have a, this 300 level class, you need to have this 100 level class. The category theory pretty much went over my head. I, I dabbled, but for someone to come in and, and Watch this again and feel. What, what are the you know, prerequisites? Yeah, prerequisites. Absolutely. Thank you. That was exactly what I was just halfway to get to the. Well, one thing uh, we could try to do is sort of, if we had something like this was to, in the category theory side, that would be different than if they're interested in. I mean, we can use databases as a way of teaching people category theory, and at the same time learning about how databases can be right. Learning about both at the same time. Yes. I think that that's key because I, I, I did use the scare quote practical. Most people who deal with it, I, I do a lot of interviewing. I ask a very basic question: What if, what is a the relation? And people always think it's about ER modeling, and they don't realize it's the table because they don't have a math background. It's phenomenal how little people actually understand the the underpinnings of, of relational technology out there. I think it would be fabulous if you were 
reawaken what is actually there, and then also have a separate thread on what category theory is, and then compare those. Things. Some people are going to be coming at it from a very different point of view. For myself, I, I'm thinking of databases, you know, all this owl stuff and ontologies is just ways of capturing meaning in this data, right? And so, no, I don't, I don't know a lot about, I don't know very little about databases. I can use them to define things. And I sort of understand multiple tables and keys to connect them, but um, much more interested in just how meaning is captured and how it's, in, in a sense, this is like work around for miscapturing. In other words, you, you capture it in different ways and it's not from, from the structure that you capture. It's not, not initially clear that there's an equivalent to that. So I'm kind of interested in that. One of, one of David's original papers on it, he used to call these schemas OLOGs, but that was all about sort of the knowledge representation side and you know, as yeah. a logic, like what does this look like as a logic and, and that kind of stuff. So there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that personally would be interesting to me. Okay. Yeah. We, could, we could also send around like a Google form or something that you like say what your interest is and which of these things would be interesting to you and try to um, work around something like that to make it as useful as possible to as many people. So you're behind all the OLOG stuff? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I saw that a while ago. That's okay. Okay. So you only have one person, one application that you're talking about uh, that's bio biology or? Oh, a different topic. Um, the application is generally that you're, you're, you have an enterprise or something, you have an acquisition, acquisition or merger, you have, for some reason you have more than one database and you want them to talk to each other. Huh? This and this tells you, um, kind of in this whole meaning idea, this person had a meaning in mind, this person had a meaning in mind. If we can find a way to map the meanings of one onto the meanings of the other, or find a common space for them both to live, then doing that using category theory gives us an automatic way to move the data that they already had. You know, meaning and examples kind of come together, like you have concepts, a person, and you have a bunch of examples. Your database instant, your schema is like your meaning, person, mother, blah, 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 employee department. The, the data is all the examples. And so, you can move all those examples through one of these meaning maps. So is it learned by the examples? It's hard to say what a data label or label data or it's um it's just that if you have these maps of meaning, if you have these functors, you can move the examples with those. Like the, it's you know, if someone's got it. Someone's got to come and do it. Exactly. Someone's got a now, key, a translation key. Right? Yep. So if you hire data tamer or you know tamer or something, and you hire some company, they might be able to find one for you automatically. You you throw up your hand, say I don't know how to do it. They'll do something for you, and you hope that it works. Ours is not so much about best effort doing something we hope works, it's about some mathematical guarantees that if you, that you guarantee will, you know, that there'll be something satisfied after you're done. So how does, how do you define in math the uh, one person's uh, meaning of, of a category versus another company's meaning of a category? How do you do Yeah, because the rule, they write down all of the rules that they intend using, well, here's a foreign key, here's a foreign key, here's a relationship between them. Like, a lot of times in a schema, if you follow a couple of foreign keys, you'll find you'll find two different paths to the same place. You can say those have to be the same. And by saying those little, saying a few of those little things, it, it really structures your data in a certain way that you can guarantee the maps um, will, will satisfy you. And therefore, they're going to constrain, they're going to keep together all the rules you told it about in the beginning. I don't know if it's, 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 it's